I want to uh, talk to you about this report that the government's chief scientific advisor wrote for the UK government. It's called Changing Identities in the UK, the Next 10 Years, Our Identity Future. And in it, the author concludes that it is going to become increasingly difficult for us to form and maintain a stable sense of identity, who we are, given the growth of social media and new technologies, which produce what he called hyperconnectivity. In other words, the increased number of connections between people and the speed of those connections between people and the growing pace of interchange of data and information between people is going to increasingly make it hard for us to maintain a sense of identity. And so what I want to do in this first talk is to convince you that the conclusion of that report, hyperconnectivity will have a transforming effect on how we see ourselves and others, is essentially correct. Okay? But of course, this immediately raises two questions. What is identity? And uh, why should we care? Why should we care if identities are harder? Because, um, well, that's the question. And uh, identity is one of those words we, we sort of pan around, you know, we exchange. And if you sit people down, and if we had longer than 20 minutes, I'd love to do that, in little groups of three and say, tell me what you think identity is. We would have a variety of definitions. It's one of those words that gets used, but uh, there's very little in the way of shared understanding between people. So this is quite important. What is identity and why should we care? And I want to begin by, by telling you a story. And it, it takes us back to 100, gosh, 180 AD, 17th of July. And we're in a room in um, uh, the council chamber in Carthage in a Roman province. And we're standing trial or well, there's a trial and we're standing with those uh, standing trial on that day before the proconsul Saturninus. And uh, there are 17 people there, 12 men and five, sorry, sorry, there are 12 people there, five women and seven men. And they would come to be known as the Silicon Martyrs. And it emerges that Saturninus, the proconsul, is not a cruel man. He's He's a kind man in many ways. He's more bewildered than angry with these people. He doesn't understand why they can't, like everybody else, submit to the rule of Rome. What delusion has gripped their mind that subverts their allegiance to Rome? What is it about their beliefs that so dominates their thinking and makes it hard for them to conform? And one of them called Speratus steps forward. He's got a document in his bag, and he says, I do not recognize the empire of this world, Saturninus, but rather I serve that God whom no man has seen nor can see with these eyes. And he points to his bag, and we're pretty certain that in that bag there were some early scripture documents. So he's pointing to these documents and saying, um, as far as it lays claim to adjudicating what I believe and what I think and what I do, I repudiate the empire of this world and I serve the Lord who is revealed in these documents, in his word. Okay? In other words, the scriptures shape my view of the world out there. That's Sparatus. But then somebody else steps forward. This time it's a woman. Her name is... Secunda. And Secunda says, I am a Christian. And then she says something even more important. She says, I wish to be what I am. I wish to be what I am. You see, Sparatus tells the Roman proconsul that what he carries in this bag means that he sees the world differently. Secunda tells him that what he's carrying in his bag the words revealed there means that she sees herself differently. And the way she sees herself, she is saying, has profound meaning for the way she lives her life. I wish 
to be what I am. And I want to suggest to you that there's something about the way human beings experience this concept of identity which is linked with the concept of flourishing, with the concept of how we live our lives, living lives well. Um, our subjective experience seems to be that when we live consistently with our identity, we, we feel that we are flourishing as human beings. That, that seems to be there in our subjective experience of ourselves. And that seems to be the basis, that felt experience, that there's a link between our sense of who we are and how we should live and how we can flourish as human beings that people appeal to in identity politics when they make that sense of who they are, the grounds of their appeal to the rest of society, that that sense of who they are should be recognized in terms of how it's worked out, being who they are as a civil right, as a right. I have a right to be who I am, to take pride in who I am, because the way we human beings experience who we are is profoundly linked with how we feel we should live. We want to live out of our identity. Let me be who I am. Do you see this interesting link between identity and, and flourishing? So that's why I think it's important. It's not an abstract concept, identity. It is a living experience that connects with how we live our lives. A lived experience that connects with how we live our lives. But, well, I don't know, let's dig a bit deeper in, that, that's why this matters. But let's dig a bit deeper into, into what identity is. And we could take a philosophical journey through Charles Taylor, uh, Paul Ricoeur, um, and we'd be here longer than 20 minutes. So in very simple concepts, what, what is identity? I, I want to suggest to you that identity is grounded in the human experience of self-awareness. Human beings, remember, are unique, at least we think we're unique, in that we are self-aware. We, we're able to stand back from ourselves and view ourselves as an object. So in human experience, the self, the self becomes an object. There's the I speaks of me. And when the I experiences me, the, the, the question that the I asks of the me is not just what is this, but who is this? What is this person's identity? There is an urge in the way that we construct and shape and experience ourselves as objects which urges us to define, to understand, to give meaning to that experience of ourselves. And so, we, 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 this is probably as good a definition, a dimension of self-awareness concerned with self-definition. Paul Ricoeur says, there are two bits to that if you think about it. There's an idem side to our identity and an ipse. The idem is the bit that's always the same. So for most of us being a male or a female is part of our idem, it's part of the sameness of who we are. For most of us, um, our facial characteristics for long periods of time seem to be pretty much part of who we are. So when I got up this morning and looked in the mirror, I was pretty much the same as when I went to bed last night. It's, a, it's an idem. But we're also aware that there are ipse, that, that there are transitioning, that there are changing aspects to who we are. So what I thought, many of the things I thought when I arrived at this conference, having listened to one or two people, are now different. And so the self is both a given and a process. We experience it as idem and ipse. And what, what's a good way of doing that, Paul Ricoeur says, and Charles Taylor, and Alistair McIntyre and other philosophers. Well, if you say to somebody, well, who are you? That they may say, well, I'm a teacher, I'm a doctor, I'm, I'm a daughter. That we identify ourselves using different labels. But when we probe a little further and say, well, tell me more. And uh, you say, well, I, 
I don't know, I, I live in England. And you say, well, tell me more about yourself. We'd, sooner or later, we go back to the beginning. I was born in a town in the north of England. My mother and father were. I grew up in, but then my father died. And then I, and sooner or later, as we begin to define, flesh out this notion of who this me is, we discover that we're speaking in terms of narrative, the story of the self. And both Ricoeur, Charles Taylor, philosophers, suggest that the self is essentially a narrated product of self-evaluation. We, we best ex understand ourselves as stories, a narration. And this story is both has some pretty fixed components. I'm a male born in England. You can't change that. But, you know, I was a doctor, but now I'm a retired doctor. And so my story is constantly being retold. Um, I, I, I was pretty successful in this area, but then I failed in that. So I have to retell my story again. Do you see the dance between the given, the process, the story as it unfolds and is rewritten in the face of experience? And so this is the notion of self as story. And I think that's probably the, the, the best sort of um, identity definition that, that, that we could probably use. And, and of course, that story is, weaves into it many different facets of um, gender, looks, nationality. Some of us here, our nationality is very important to us because of the situation at the moment at home. For others, it's our, the social roles that we occupy. I'm a mum, and I'm proud of being a mum, and I love being at home with my kids, you see. That's a big part of my identity, and bubbles up to the surface. It becomes a, a strong theme of my story right now. But for somebody else, it's my status. I'm the leader of a church. I'm the kind of person that people look up to and rely on. I'm res responsibilities around here, you see. And for others, it's their sexuality. And so different facets of the story bubble up to assume greater importance at different points in our lives. So our stories are told and woven together in different ways. And these different dimensions of identity occupy different degrees of prominence as our story unfolds and as it's retold. So, where do we go from here? Well, let's return to this notion of hyperconnectivity because Charles Taylor, the philosopher again, he says if you think back to the pre-enlightenment period, the givenness of our identity was much more prominent because people were much more stable. I was born into a locality. Who my father was mattered. So many people, my name is Harrison, the son of Harry or I'm a baker. So the features of, of my life were very often given. My father was a baker, I'm a baker. People didn't move around so much. So the process of identity was much easier, more stable in the Enlightenment era. It was in the post-Enlightenment era that, that, that man who became the measure of all things began to understand himself as one who is self-defined. And of course, this process was hastened by urbanization. People leave the farms to go into the factories. Families are disrupted. People move jobs, education. He was a baker, my dad, now I'm a doctor. And so the Enlightenment both philosophically gave momentum to the idea that I define myself now. Just because my father was a baker doesn't mean that I'm a baker now or that I aspire to be a baker. I have a new set of values, and social conditions accelerated that momentum. And of course, in our modern era, the, 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 the ways in which we redefine ourselves, re-understand ourselves, are vastly multiplied. Consumerism and marketing, much marketing is based on making us feel insecure and providing an alternative solution. So look at yourself. If you looked in the mirror lately, you could look like this. And so our identity, insofar as 
image is a part of that is shaken by advertising and we're offered an alternative a way of reinventing ourselves and every day when we open our computers adverts fall across our eyes offering us possibilities of self invention social media offers us numerous platforms of self invention and promotion Twitter Facebook up date your status and of course they frame how we do that Twitter says you do it in 140 characters so they actually frame and dictate to us the lens through which we begin to see ourselves as someone who is presented to the world in 140 characters and then we notice that others retweet the good things but they don't retweet the bad things that are said about them and this begins to frame the way we characterize ourselves to the world and this is the hyperconnectivity, the social media that's being spoken of and of course virtual worlds of self-invention allow the self to completely lose itself in other dimensions of experience to become another and this is very interesting and potentially quite dangerous to the notion of formation of identity says the chief scientific officer because stability and cohesion is quite important how do I form relationships if the person who comes tomorrow is different from the person who is here today if I don't have an inner sense of continuity some stability to who I am if the self is fragmenting how do I deal with challenges failures successes as I simply ricochet between the experiences that the world demands of me how do I form stable relationships offer to the world a sense of stable character how do I accumulate wisdom sense of stability and significance worth in the world all of these things are threatened and so it's not simply a philosophical issue it's a mental health issue it's a social issue and that's why it matters and I suggest that's what it is and of course underpinning these modern and postmodern experiences of life there are some postmodern philosophies at work in our culture I suppose the best example of which is queer theory queer theory grounded in the work of Michael Foucault philosopher says that there are no received categories of, um, of being that are in any way innate or given in even so far as male and female all of these things are social constructions there that, that they are foisted upon us by the religious and cultural elites that stand to gain by dividing us into male and female and setting up systems of control and because these things are socially constructed they can be socially deconstructed you can be who you want to be and so queer theory underpins and sustains a society in which the self is fragmenting and uncertain and of course once again we return to the problem that that it, it's hard to, to to be myself to know what I'm worth and, and the self mindlessly says I'm important I'm worthy it, it attempts to define its own significance but in doing that it simply intensifies the question every time I say how much I'm worth a voice in my ear says um, are you sure on what basis what's the ground that you're a special person who says what about these adverts that are telling you something different and so this fragmentation of the self simply to quote February's New Yorker turns the self in on itself in an endless quest of self invention that the media draws us into and that I want to suggest to you is the problem that our society is facing increasingly and that that report was speaking to and I want to finish by by saying is it a problem or is it an opportunity for Christian apologetics 
for the way of life which the Christian faith speaks of.